Hello, and welcome to this episode of Brainstorm. In Brainstorm, I'm taking your mind out of the gutter. Learning new things can sometimes be a little bit depressing, so to say. Too much exposure to complex issues uh, might lead to this uncomfortable feeling you have about the future. Been there, done that. The only way to stay sane in this age of information is to keep the hope. For that, we need lessons from the past. Not just any past, the deep past. I believe that if you want to predict or model the future and see, well, we're going this direction or that direction, well then you cannot just reference today. Or even a hundred years ago for that matter. I believe that if you want to accurately project where we are heading in the future, then we need the lessons from the past. Not just any point in the past, no. The deep past, the big, fat, red lines. Well, you wanted to sign something. You've made a deal then. You can't just be critical. Can't. You have to think about solutions too. Solutions that improve the world. Even though it often means standing on very slippery ice and exposing yourself to criticism from others. Now, if you are like Eddie, uh, you just throw yourself out there. Uh, well, good for you. However, that might not be so nice for you. Uh, there's a more safe way to do it. I want you to become an operator, so to say, on the fine balance between your comfort zone and learning something new, or being an explorer, so to say. Eddie just jumped out there and he was ex exposed to everything all at once, uh, but there is, there is a better way to do it. If you're on this edge, then you can just take a dip every once in a while and then go back to your comfort zone. Immerse yourself. If there is more of us, more operators, so to say, then we will have a chance of tackling some of the bigger issues in this world. In other words, I want you to stay engaged, but don't get overwhelmed. Keep the hope, because I believe that most people are good inside. I think this is an, a human uh, quality. Evil, true evil does exist though, but I think somewhere deep down, it is just good gone wrong. I believe that all people have the in inherent desire to do good and the only thing that's truly keeping us from doing that is ourselves and the misconceptions we have. In Brainstorm, I am your host Eddie and I'm taking you to a better tomorrow. Hello and welcome to this first episode of Brainstorm. <laughs> so, in this episode I'm picking up the pieces again. In last episode of Nerd Rage, I left a giant cliffhanger regarding how hunter-gatherers view themselves and the world around them. Uh, in this episode I will expand on that. I wanted to start off this series by becoming personal right away. By going straight for you. Hopefully, after this video, you'll be a little bit more self-critical and start to ask yourself how you view nature. I will try to show you a, a different way, another way of looking at nature uh, by giving you lessons from the past. Subsequently, uh, the brainstorm part of this video is where I try to sketch an image of how I think we should view uh, nature as a society nowadays. That will be the slippery ice part. But first, let me start off with this teaser. How can a wolf change the course of a river? Before you think, oh man, this, this dude has completely lost it, uh, give it some time. Try to think. I know what you're thinking. You probably had some of those mushrooms uh, he was talking about in his previous ep episode of Nerd Rage. No, not the case, unfortunately. Now, park this question in the back of your brain and we will move on. The first important thing to note is that the way we perceive nature is in itself a social construct. 
uh, somewhere out there is the real divide between nature and culture. But we make our own decision on how, what we perceive as nature and what we perceive as culture. In modern Western society, the world of nature is often explained as what lies out there. However, this enforces dualism as, it's, as it creates this gap between uh, what we perceive, our mind, and matter, which is static nature. We get a knowledge on, of the world of nature uh, on the base of this relation, which is called uh, human being, this divide, so to say. Also, we exploit uh, nature for resources. We, we see it as an apple tree from which we can pick an apple. However, societies that are living in uh, nature tend not to perceive themselves as disconnected to nature. Uh, Hunter-gatherers, for example, they view themselves as agents within a system of relationships. For them, nature is a very complicated construct uh, in, in which there's all sorts of relationship between entities. For example, the bear goes out in the woods. No surprise there, right? Does a bear shit in the woods? Of course he does. Then the bear mostly hunts for salmon. And the wolf is also out there, but it has its eyes on the deer. So try to imagine this. Imagine you live this life you live your life exactly in this scenery I'm I'm showing you here in this picture. All day, all night, 24-7. You are living the exact picture I'm showing you here. Then you will see all of these entities doing what? Well, they're doing exactly the same as you. Hunting, eating, mating, sleeping, moving through the landscape to find a nice spot to do this. Uh, in other words, you would start to understand why these entities do what they do. Because you are interwoven with them, uh, you do the same. But there's also the inanimate entities, uh, those you don't understand as well as animals. Because animals are quite plain in what they want and what they do, because they're observable. However, what about the rocks? What about the mountains? What about the lake? What about the trees? These are things you can't grasp as easily. That's why hunter-gatherers have come up with uh, elaborate mythologies and stories of their origin and what it is they want. Let's look at another word then, landscape. First things first, what is landscape? Well, according to Ingold, uh, landscape is not simply the world of nature. He cites the following definition. Landscape is qualitative and heterogeneous. It is all that you see around, living and non-living, natural and artificial. Now, now we start to get more on the phenomenological side of the story. Try to say that 10 times in a row, I challenge you. If you really want to grasp this concept, I suggest uh, watching Brother Bear. It's an animated series, I know. I'm a grown up dude, but I don't give a fuck. It really explores the concept of nature as a system of relationship between entities. For example, the spirit of the lake maintains a different relationship with, let's say, the spirit of the bear or the fish than with that of the deer or the wolf. Another thing to understand is that it is up to you to maintain these relationships, to maintain a healthy relationship with the spirit of the bear or the lake. Uh, if the lake dries up, for example, some sort of natural event happened, then uh, hunter-gatherers tend to interpret that as something has gone wrong in the relationship somewhere. So what do you do if you have relationship problems? Well, then you could try to find a coach and try to fix it. And that's where shamans come into the picture. Uh, shamanism is one of the oldest practices in the world. In fact, it's the oldest religion in the world. I think uh, shamanism has in shamanism, whatever, potato, potato, has evolved in order to fix the broken uh, relationship uh, with the spirit world or with in inanimate entities. These shamans uh, were often seen as being capable to interact with the spirit world, uh, most often through altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
the answer to these broken relationships uh, often lies somewhere in the field of reciprocity. If we take something, we must give something back. Hunter gatherers tend to have a very strong sense of reciprocity. So if some of the cogs are off, so to say, then we must have taken too much, right? All right, one more example of this other way of view nature, and then we will move on, I promise. So this is an archeological example or an archeozoological example, to be more precise. This is a subdiscipline of archeology span that studies the relationship between humans and animals. It does this not only by studying the physical remains, the bones, but also by studying the relationship between humans and animals in the past. Now, one quick warning before we move on. Uh, as an archeologist, I am trained in studying graves and looking at the remains of long gone people. For me, it feels very natural to uh, know that everything is finite and that we all end up in the ground eventually. Nevertheless, I can understand if that some of you might find this uh, macabre or not so easy to watch. Therefore, if you are in any way disturbed by pictures of skeletons or graves, please skip forward to the conclusions. There I will give you a summary, but without showing the actual pictures. Okay, so you have joined me. Very good. Well, the case study I have for you today is a Mesolithic grave from the Ertebulle culture. It is located in Denmark, just north of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, throughout Denmark, uh, many sites of prehistoric uh, hunter-gatherers are known. It's literally a playing field for archaeologists. So today I'm going to focus on Vetbak, a Mesolithic uh, cemetery. It was uh, excavated in 1975, uh, located while a park, uh, car park was being built. 17 graves were excavated here and almost all the bodies have been identically positioned uh, on their backs with feet close together and hands by the sides. Uh, these graves were in neat parallel rows. So today I'm going to focus on one burial in particular, grave number eight. So what is so special about this grave? Well, first let me tell you some details. So what we see here is a mother and a child burial, uh, exceptionally well preserved. Every bone is uh, still in a very good condition. And we see several grave goods in this grave. Uh, for instance, flint knives, uh, deer and elk teeth as grave goods and a uh, use of a red ochre, uh, so symbolism, uh, but also a swan's wing. And this is where I want to focus on. Answering all of these questions is pretty straightforward, but of course we are interested in the story. Uh, that's why we want to ask the why question. So why do we see a swan's wing in this burial? Well, the majority of zooarchaeological studies uh, of faunal remains uh, simply take the killing of, uh, of the animals present in the assemblage for, for granted. In other words, as an action, with no meaning other than uh, the ways to an end. Uh, so simply uh, the procurement of meat and uh, animal resources. Think about this. Um, if, however, humans did not conceive of animals uh, as material and calorific uh, resources, simply said meat balloons, uh, but as sentient uh, and social individuals, then their capture and killing requires a different uh, conceptualization, or we have to think differently about that. So what happened here? Well, we see that a woman has died, probably during uh, childbirth, this is most likely. Um, but one inf important thing to note, the dead don't bury themselves, all right? So this grave is a representation of society towards this particular, particular event. And society used a swan's wing to represent something. Um, but why a swan's wing? But one important thing to note here is that uh, it, not the entire swan's wing was recovered. Uh, it was just the tip of the wing. And uh, the child was placed very uh, carefully on the tip of this wing. And it's not a matter of uh, conservation either, because every small bone, like the finger bones and, the, and, and bones that are more likely to have disintegrated are also present. So it's not a matter of conservation. In reality, the child was not placed on the whole wing, but just the tip of the wing. One might say that this wing 
represents uh, like transport into the afterlife like if the intention was like to let the soul fly into the afterlife then you can say okay a swan's wing fits that picture however think about this if the intention was for uh, the soul to fly into the afterlife then how come just the tip of the wing was recovered and not the whole wing think about that so this next idea just blew my mind uh, this idea comes from dr uh, overton by the way he's a great archaeologist uh, he's really connected with his line of work a passionate uh, man I've excavated with him in Britain on a Mesolithic site. Dr. O, he likes to be called. Now, let's take a closer look at whooper swans. On the one hand, we see that whooper swans uh, use their wings to smack the living shit out of each other whenever they're angry, for example, about territory. Uh, but on the other hand, you also see the highly social practice of what is called carpal flapping, where the wings are held outstretched shaking their tips in expression of bonding between individuals. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, find any footage of this, but you'll just have to believe me. Mesolithic humans, therefore, may have understood the wings based not on an inherent uh, ability to facilitate flight, but on their uh, communicative and highly social roles. So, in other words, uh, they may have known that swans, swans use them as a social practice. Thus, the tip of a swan's wing, uh, if prehistoric hunter-gatherers did not see animals as simple, simple meat balloons uh, waiting to be eaten, but as individuals, which I have been trying to make a case here uh, so far, then this Mesolithic burial might represent an expression of bonding, which seems a very likely way for society to represent a mother and child. Moving on now. So we've come from a deep past where humans um, saw themselves not as uh, disconnected from nature and where we saw animals as agents and uh, entities uh, within a system and maintaining social relationships with everything. Then nowadays we see them more as an object of either study or exploitation. Uh, we see humans as separate entities that can manipulate nature uh, to their desire. But as we science more, and this is the fun thing, as we science more we are beginning to understand the power of uh, the individual in complex ecosystems. So for those of you who've read Jurassic Park by uh, Michael Crichton, where uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm says, life will find a way. Of course, he's a, a chaos theorist, so he studies chaos theory. It's a very good example of complex systems uh, have their own dynamics, which is basically saying that even if you have a system where there's a defined set of rules, uh, small changes can have big uh, impacts and that I will show you now. So remember the wolf and the river I showed you in the beginning? This is an example of what is called a trophic cascade uh, in the Yellowstone Park. So the wolf was hunted to extinction in Yellowstone Park not too long ago. Uh, then some, some scientists decided to release just one pack of wolves and see what will happen. So this study happened over the course of uh, 40 years or so and a lot did happen. See, as the wolves began doing their thing, which is hunting for elk, uh, it, ch it changed the behavior of these elk. Before, they were just grazing and at the riverside going absolutely bananas on everything that is green and growing there. They didn't care about the trees, they were, they were just like, I uh, cry me a river. Now, with the coming of the wolves, they started to learn that they're not safe on these plains, on these big open plains, because uh, they got nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and they can easily be surrounded. Thus, they changed their behavior, coming there to graze for short periods of time, and then retreating to the relative safety of the mountains. 
Uh, this in turn allowed the saplings of certain trees to grow beyond the point where uh, they are vulnerable for grazing. What happens when these trees start to grow? Uh, they start to grow a solid root network and uh, these roots retain soil. So uh, they'll hold the soil down around them. Uh, so the river started meandering again around these roots, around these trees, creating a meandering river instead of a broad flowing river. This in turn led to an explosion of wildlife uh, there because uh, trees started falling over in the river and beavers would become attracted again to these uh, biotopes. And beavers are landscape architects, so they uh, they create this environment for themselves, they like, and they in turn attract all sorts of small fish and animals and birds that, that like to live in that environment as well. So you can see that the, just the in introduction of just one pack of wolves uh, led the entire ecosystem uh, to change. Um, and there's way more biodiversity now, so there you have it, life will find a way. So moving on now, I think you get the picture somewhat uh, now let's talk big fat red lines. How should we view nature in the future then? That's the biggest question here and here's where the brainstorm begins. Because I think that we, we've gone a little bit too far, we need to take a step back um, and try to become uh, caretakers and protectors uh, where we view nature still as an object of uh, study and ex exploitation but carefully monitor the balance uh, within it and maintaining our social relationships with it because also nature has this inherent quality that it can really make us happy beings we used to see uh, animals as uh, the most important thing to maintain uh, because we're interwoven with this system and now we see them more as a background noise to human life but the question is, how sure can you be that we as humans are different than animals? To illustrate this, uh, think of a scale from nature to culture where uh, on the left side every, everything is very animal, if you will, and on the right side everything is very human, if you will. So a division between nature and culture. And as we start to plot a different animals there where we think well this animal is smarter than this one or this one is more cultured than this one um, you start to get a picture of uh, the, this division we've created between uh, humans and animals however if you really study uh, some of these examples of, of animals uh, and you really study them then you'll start to see that animals can also have uh, complex emotions, complex relations, uh, whatever. So, for example, I'm gonna make it hard on myself. I'm gonna take an animal which you probably view as, as food and as the most dumb thing out there, fish. So, there's this book by uh, Jonathan Balcom, uh, I'll show you here. So, his book is called What a Fish Knows. Uh, the inner lives of our underwater cousins and let me read the description here. It's, it's just hilarious So a New York Times bestseller do fishes think do they really have three second memories? And can they recognize the humans who peer back at them from above the surface of water? Taking us under the sea through streams and estuaries and to the other side of the aquarium glass to reveal the surprising capabilities of fishes Although there are more than 30,000 species of fish, um, we rarely consider how individual fishes think, feel and behave. And what he has done is he has really scienced uh, this concept. Okay, can we, um, where is this boundary between nature and culture and how human are fish when you really study them? And that's where you get very, very interesting results because, for example, the common misconception that a goldfish can't retain knowledge uh, longer than uh, a, an hour or so or a day is, is co just complete bollocks. He's, he studied this with experiments and shown that even after two years, it's a, a goldfish still remembers certain aspects or things or can, they can do tricks, you can learn them things. It's, it, it blows your mind. For example, this uh, pufferfish I'm showing you here, uh, he, 
they create complex uh, uh, environments. So basically, uh, they they do architecture, so to say, and they have such a lively personality that. For example, one of the biggest uh, aquarium YouTubers out there, Aquarium Co-op, has this guy as a mascot because it's it's so smart that it's almost a dog. If you want to uh, learn more about this, then I really suggest uh, reading this guy's book because it will blow your mind. So some of you might start to think, well, isn't this guy just using a lot of anthropomorphisms on these uh, creatures? Well. No, he is really science it. I'm well aware of the fact that anthropomorphisms might lead to invalid conclusions. In my previous job, I worked as a 3D laser scanner and I had to visit a lot of farms, uh, milking cows companies. So I had the idea that it must have been a bit of a sad life for the cows because there's nothing to do all day long but standing and eating. Uh, who would want that kind of life, right? Then there was this one interaction with a cow which absolutely blew my mind. She was beautiful. Number 44 that she was called. No, 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 just kidding. Not, not, nothing of that sort, I'm afraid. So while I was just scanning away, a bit bored to be, to be honest, uh, then one of the cows came, came towards me. Uh, she was very nice, uh, playful and curious as to what I was doing. Uh, I was just standing still, uh, not being much of a threat. In fact, I had to stand still because if I would move, then I would ruin the 3D scanner. As I stood there, she started sticking out her tongue and I let her investigate my hands. Anyways, I was welcomed by the distraction. I was bored out of my mind as well. Then I decided to, to try and pet the cow on the head because she was being a good boy. By this sudden hand movement, uh, she just flew away, running back to the other cows uh, who ran away as well. I just, in one, ju in one short movement, I, I just f***ed up the whole scan and the whole barn. So then it struck me, what do cows want in life? Think about it. If you think from, from the perspective of a cow, and then cows are herd animals, they want a boring life. Uh, in nature, uh, they, did, they don't like predation, they don't like stress, they want a boring and simple grazing life. So basically what we provide for them, and I'm not talking about all the other practices where you take cows away from the mother and all that horrible stuff, but I'm just talking about the core essence of a cow. Um, cows like a boring life. So no anthropomorphisms there. So as a final note here, I think that if we learned how to manage ecosystems effectively, then we can give nature a little bit more space to do so. Uh, we need to stop using all of the land around us for farming and go vertical. Um, optimize our current farming practices and give nature more space to reclaim. Uh, this way, we can reap benefits from well-maintained ecosystems. And it is, this is not to be underestimated. Uh, if you have a well-maintained ecosystem, you can farm a lot from that. All right. And also, if you have well-optimized and balanced farming practices, for example, vertical farming, then you can still continue doing the things we used to do. Uh, but we'll have benefits from both uh, ways of living. In that way, nature can provide for us all, and we can provide for nature. So there's reciprocity I was talking about in the beginning. I truly hope that this will be the future of humanity. Alright? That was Brainstorm, Eddie the Eagle, out.